Okay, so welcome to uh, the next session. Uh, to those of you who just joined us, let me remind you to keep your um, mic muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand using the feature of Zoom or ask your question in the chat. Uh, our next speaker is Benjamin Bassa from ENS, and he will tell us about the origin of the six gluon amplitudes in planar n equals four. Please take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Well, thanks a lot. I would like to start by thanking the organizer for organizing this meeting, for maintaining it and organizing it online, and for giving the opportunity to talk. So <clears throat> I would like to talk about some something we've done recently with Lance and Georgios. So Lance already um, <clears throat> gave a spoiler. He explained a little bit uh, what I was going to talk about. So it's about a very particular point, or a very particular amplitude in a very particular theory, but uh, so it's probably going to be the most uh, focused of all the talk of this conference, I guess. But uh, we will try to do it at, uh, at finite capital. So the goal being to, uh, I mean, precisely try to understand how amplitude looks like in, um, at finite capital. <clears throat> So, um, well, there is a lot of motivation for studying scattering amplitude in n equals four. Um, I don't think there is any point recalling them here uh, for this audience, besides Lance already gave a very nice uh, <clears throat> uh, summary of them. And we also have a lot of techniques for computing them at various values of the coupling. So one of them is the one we um, heard about in uh, Lance's talk about um, the perturbative amplitude bootstrap. So it's probably the most efficient way of building amplitudes at weak coupling, at least for six and seven points. And it relies on a certain amount of information or knowledge on the space of functions and also some physical requirement or constraint. <clears throat> but it's not the only one then. Uh, another one is the Pentagon flex tube OP, which is perhaps less uh, well known. And that one work at finite coupling, so it's a kind of complementary regime, <clears throat> but around a very big specific point, which is a collinear limit. So it's not, so it's covering, um, the coupling dependence in a way, but okay, it's hard to recover information about uh, uh, kinematical information that is captured so nicely and quickly by, uh, by the previous method, by the amplitude bootstrap. And lastly, uh, there is a string theory that we believe is also there, hidden in the, <clears throat> how to say, the, the correlation between gluons and so on as strong coupling. And it is in terms to leading order, at least it is in terms of minimal surfaces that live in a different space, it lives, that live in, in ADS5. Uh, well, the string theory is probably not the simplest uh, point to start with because it's not very clear how to expand a strong coupling. Of course, there as well, there is a perturbative story, but it's not clear how to bootstrap things and it's not clear how to calculate. But at least classically, we get these minimal surfaces and they give kind of very nice complementary geometrical uh, perspective on the entire problem, I believe. But of course that one rely on uh, other type of assumption, which is uh, the gauge string duality. When we put everything together, we get a very nice uh, description. But the dream of resumming or plotting an amplitude at finite coupling is not uh, fulfilled yet. So we have a lot of information, but we are not yet <coughs> there in terms of um, solving completely and, uh, and plotting. So perhaps this is wishful thinking, but if there is one theory where we might hope to be able to do that at some point one day, it's certainly n equals four in the planar limit. So <clears throat> we should keep trying, I guess. And the closest target, or the, the simplest one at least, is a six gluon MHV amplitude. It is the equivalent of the four point amplitude in normal theory. <clears throat> And we believe it is the same as uh, the hexagon Wilson loop in the planar limit. So that is something that is well known. So I guess by this audience, it has to do with this uh, scattering amplitude Wilson loop duality with that has been valid at strong coupling first and, and eventually understood to, to hold at any coupling in this theory, perhaps still conjecturally, and I don't, I'm not entirely sure in the planar limit. And as an immediate consequence of this, um, equality and, and the symmetry that come along the way is the fact that smaller polygons are sort of trivial. So the four and five point amplitudes um, are just, um, well, trivial. Are entirely controlled at any value of the coupling by the BDS on that, which 
<clears throat> essentially, after removing the piece that is a function of the kinematics falls down to the knowledge of the cusp anomalous dimension, that is a function of just the coupling constant. <clears throat> okay, so every amplitude in this theory, of course, have um, infrared divergences that map to UV divergences on the Wilson loop side. And in, in practice, if we want to compute something, we must uh, subtract those uh, divergences. And we probably want to do it in a, in a friendly way. Well, with a friendly, that it's to be defined, of course, but at least we want definitely to remove divergences. And sometimes we can remove a little bit more than that, some finite piece. And, uh, and that depends, of course, on what we are willing to do, I guess. So uh, during this talk, I will be mostly using this quantity, Matkal E, uh, which is a ratio of uh, the six point amplitude that depend on the Mandelstam invariant, Sij, but also on epsilon, which is a dimensional organization parameter, divided by this so-called BDS-like quantity, which I will not define, but which is essentially BDS modulo some small modification. <clears throat> and it can be written in terms of the reminder function that people also like to use and calculate in this theory, that is a quantity that is finite and start at two loops up to a small addition that is controlled by the cusp anomalous dimension and some very simple function, which is some, a bunch of li And here everything is finite. After doing so, this ratio is well defined and it is only a function of the three hexagon cross ratios that we can, that we can form. And that is what we get essentially from this uh, equality here, which is that the amplitude after again removing the part that is a bit anomalous and divergent, uh, conformally invariant function of whatever conformally invariant quantity I can define out of this six point here, which are given by, by those. <clears throat> well, in general, that's a very complicated function, of course, and uh, well, Lance explained a little bit how to calculate it in uh, twig coupling using uh, this bootstrap. And uh, as I said here, the goal is more modest. We like to focus on the uh, very particular, particular point, sorry, which is the origin. <clears throat> And uh, well, what we call the origin is of course the point where all three cross, cross ratios are going to zero, which is also equivalent to a sort of triple collinear limit where we are sending some pair of uh, Mandelstam invariant to zero. So here on this figure, we are taking an hexagon and we are flattening pairs of edges such as to obtain a null triangle. It's not something that live in real uh, space time, it's nothing that, that live in some analytical con continuation. But anyway, we can certainly do that and it's kind of interesting to look at this point. And uh, the reason why um, we believe or people found it interesting is an observation um, which, were, which was made first, I believe, at strong coupling and, and later on at weak coupling to very high loop order, which is at the six gluon amplitude displays some sort of Sudakov-like suppression in this, uh, in this limit. It's not something that we understand very well physically, but something that we can observe and then uh, conjecture to all true and, and study. <clears throat> and the statement is that uh, the amplitude exponent shape. So if you take the log of the amplitude, what you get are just like logarithm. Uh, there is no structure left. I mean, in, when you send the free cross ratio to zero, there is not much you can, you can write down except logarithm but you only get them um, only quadratic combination of them, okay? Which given the permutation symmetry here means that you can essentially uh, write down the answer of our basis of two, uh, I mean, two structure which are summarized here, okay? So as Lance already explained, it's non-trivial since we might expect transcendentality to increase, I mean, I mean, it's non-trivial that things exponentiate in this manner that we only get uh, <clears throat> something that is quadratic in log. It's also non-trivial that we don't get anything that is linear in log. So, but anyway, as I said, it's not something we understand very well, but we certainly see that happening at weak and a strong coupling. And so the most natural guess is that it is valid at any coupling up to some function, which must be only function of the coupling, which, which we call anomalous dimension abusively which I didn't in here as gamma oct, gamma hex, and also for the subleading term, some constant C naught, okay? 
And as I said here, I'm, throw, I'm, I'm just throwing away everything that is polynomial in the U. You should expect, of course, this regime to, to, to also receive power suppressed correction, but this is not what we are after. What we want instead is to calculate as accurately as we can these three functions of the coupling and see to which extent they could be related also to the cusp, which we, uh, which we like and understand very well through integrability. <coughs> So it's certainly one of the best opportunity to study an amplitude at final capping. Of course, again, it's in some very peculiar kinematics. It's not throughout the entire kinematical plane. But, but anyway, it's a kind of new structure that hasn't been tried uh, <clears throat> before. And it's also a chance to practice resummation if we're aiming at resumming anything. This is definitely a point or a corner where, where we can see whether or not our techniques allows us to uh, resum anything. So the first evidence about this point, as I said, or maybe the second, I don't know, was weak coupling, where we have a lot of data uh, with this hexagon function bootstrap program, augmented with Stayman and, and so on. <laughs> and there is a lot of uh, uh, augmentation. <clears throat> uh, we can compute six gluon amplitude through uh, seven loops for any kinematics. So I just put here, a sample of references is probably not exhaustive, but uh, okay, it has a lot of names. Uh, hopefully, <clears throat> the other one are just different permutation. And through five loops, um, I restricted myself to, to five loops because seven loop data, six and seven loop data are huge, <clears throat> well, huge, bigger, and they will not fit easily here. Uh, this is what we get. So one, two, three, four, five loop for the, the four quantity of interest. I also put the cusp <coughs> in the table for comparison. And what we immediately see is that we don't get any crazy numbers. What we get are just uh, usual Riemann zeta values, nothing more complicated than that. And, uh, and also up to a jump of transcendentality between the anomalous dimension and constant that could have been anticipated, I guess. Uh, they are all very similar. So essentially you use the same numbers, but with different rational factor in front. <clears throat> it's kind of encouraging, maybe also expected, I don't know, but uh, to, 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 to think and to look for uh, um, similarities in the description of all of this object. There is also something that we immediately notice, which is that this gamma oct, the guy that controls this uh, behavior here, which we can isolate actually by setting all three cross ratio to be the same. So if we imagine approaching the, the origin through the diagonal, <coughs> through the sequence or the family, the one parameter family of uh, symmetric uh, hexagon, uh, then we will kill this guy, but we will have this uh, gamma oct that remains. So it's a sort of more symmetrical object in a way. Uh, it is on the diagonal. And, uh, and it also looks much simpler. When we look at the data, we see that it only involves data two, four, six, eight. There are no data three. Okay, and that goes on like that uh, through seven loop at least, and presumably higher loop as well. <clears throat> in fact, if we go to pi, to powers of pi instead of zetas, or uh, even zeta series, we find that they are uh, easy to generate, I would say. So they are just obtained by expanding this log of cosh to pi g. Okay, <clears throat> so um, why is it interesting? Well, it, it turns out that this, this quantity was found already in a, in a different object, in a four point function, in the light like limit of a four point function of a correlator of large charge BPS operator, which was called uh, the octagon. So the name is perhaps a little bit misleading because it is truly a four point function of local operators. But because at every point here, at every corner, we do have operator with a large R charge, we can think that there is actually extra age living at the cusp. These are not age in space time, these are age in uh, R space of sort. I don't know if it's correct to say like that, but uh, it is definitely true that they have a little bit of length. <clears throat> and so if we count them in, then of course we get eight ages instead of four and the name of octagon. But it has very little to do with the octagon that we will, uh, that we could study with amplitudes and that we will not study in this talk for sure. So the notation is a bit misleading, but it's a bit historical in a way since it was first discovered in this context. 
And uh, th this is an object that, that can be studied using integrability very efficiently and to, uh, <clears throat> almost exactly in the coupling. It's probably one of the simplest quantity one can think of. And, uh, and it was determined recently at finite coupling and shown to, to give rise to this nice quantity. So for the, for the remaining quantity, we need something much more powerful. Um, we need some, some hammer to, uh, <clears throat> to solve for them. And this is where um, I like to use the, the collinear limit and the flux tube. I see them, uh, I'm already late, so try to be fast. Um, well, the idea is that um, this is a different limit. We are only taking one collinear limit where five and six become collinear. It corresponds to sending one cross ratio to zero. And, uh, and the picture is that we are flattening this cusp and this, when we do that, flatten cusp on the, on the square, what we get are excitation that propagate on the, on the flux tube, okay? So that's the old idea of the OPE. I'm, I'm sure you, you heard about it many, many times. And practically what it means is that we can write the, the Wilson loop as a, as a sum of excitations that carry energy, momenta, and uh, uh, energy momentum and, and angular momentum. <clears throat> that are conjugate to this time, space, and, and chemical potentials that encode information about the cross ratio. Okay, and when U2 is small, the time is very large, so the Wilson loop is stretched, and the excitation propagates over a very, very long time. So, <clears throat> the flux tube state of interest here, the fluctuation of this, uh, of this flux tube here, well, they're also very well known. So first of all, the ground state is controlled is this well-known GKP string, which has some energy density controlled by the cusp. So we see the cusp showing up very naturally. And the excitation are just whatever transverse excitation of this string. I mean, we can put on the string here. And they have an energy that is given by the twist uh, in, the, in the field theory. <clears throat> So the Pentagon OP is a way of uh, getting all of the information we need about this sum, not just uh, what we should sum over, but also what, what are the integrand here. And um, we get them because when we think about cutting an hexagon into two pieces, well, we will of course get two pentagons and uh, because we can have excitation here on this edge after the cut, uh, then we will get uh, what we call a pentagon transition, which is a pentagon with some insertion here along the edge that represents the excitation. And we can, we know them at, in, at, at finite coupling thanks to integrability. So, but that is for the OPE, uh, which is a collinear limit and the origin is not that uh, close to that. So the collinear limit is this edge here, at least the one I'm considering. And what we want to do is that we want to take a limit uh, that will bring us to the origin. It's actually, the origin is quite close to, to be the, on the boundary of the domain of convergence of the OPE series. So we can use the OPE series, but we must resum it at the, at, the, at the bottom line. But fortunately, we don't have to resum everything. The OPE series is quite um, a mess. There are many, many terms. Um, but the terms that we care about here are the ones that get excited when we try to go closer and closer along this space to the origin. So this is sending this phi parameter, this angle, uh, chemical potential to, uh, to infinity. And so the ones, the states that were exciting out of the, of the flux tube are the ones that are the lightest uh, charge state, okay? Where the charge here is the helicity. And this is this form a tower of so-called gluonic excitation, which can have LCT one, two, three, and so on. So that's all we need. And so uh, in practice, we can we can remove everything else that we have in this theory that are like scalars, fermions, and so on. And we can focus on what whatever is left, which are these gluons. And and for them, we have some very nice formula. Well, very nice. We can we can write the formula in a, in a very compact and concise way. I gave it here, but probably not hard to digest if you see it for the first time. Um, <clears throat> punchline is that if you know how to compute these complicated sums of interval, then you are done, essentially. And it's also very convenient at weak coupling because practically, you know, the, the N-gluon contribution here, so the, <clears throat> the N-fold integral is, um, is of order N, um, n square, it enters at n square. So for instance, uh, through three loops, we only need to study the one particle exchange, through eight loops, the two particle exchange. So excitation kicking very, very slowly. 
and uh, what is which makes the entire sum uh, rather easy to evaluate at recovery. Of course, we will still have to carry out the integrals and so on, but that can be done by, by some techniques that was developed by uh, Georges. <clears throat> so, as I said, in practice, uh, well, we could evaluate things at weak coupling and eventually send the chemical potential to infinity, but there is a, there is a shortcut. Uh, what we can do is immediately uh, um, deform or, or write the sum as, as a contour integral. And, um, and eventually manipulate this contour such that we get the, the, the leading contribution at large pi right away. So that is something that goes by the, the name of the sum of the Watson transform. And it, it associated to this uh, very well-known way of deforming the contour. And eventually when phi is very large, uh, closing it on the, on the left, such as to pick the leading singularity. So here the leading singularity or regi pole turns out to be just a point at a equal to zero. So what we have to do in practice, here is an example, is just um, eventually um, calculate whatever integral in rapid easy space we have to do and, uh, and then uh, read out the leading singularity at a equal to zero. So I will have to skip this. Uh, also this leaf to finite coupling, I guess. So <clears throat> what is nice is that thanks to this uh, simplification, um, we can, well, we can isolate the piece of the answer that is relevant and we can after massaging, bring it to, to a form that is ex extremely suitable for calculation. And uh, uh, what we found is that we could, we could write it as an infinite dimensional integral, um, which they share some, some Gaussian weight here that is controlled by the BES kernel. So the BES kernel, it's an infinite dimensional matrix that gives us a cusp anomalous dimension at finite coupling upon inversion. And the matrix elements here are known explicitly, they are given by uh, integral of product of uh, Bessel function. <clears throat> so what is nice about the origin is that when we send, when we send this chemical potential to infinity, um, the other ingredient here, which is this F, which is a determinant, a complicated determinant, ends up being Gaussian as well. And it is essentially just shifting the kernel by some small amount, which I call delta M. So instead of having a problem that is controlled by the BS kernel and so very closely related to the cusp, what we get is some shifted kernel that we must evaluate. That is something that we observe in perturbation theory. We cannot prove it, but, but at least we could in this way of formulating the problem, we could identify the, the pattern and, and so identify which deformation we should switch in to, uh, to, um, <clears throat> to get the, the finite coupling description. And, and from, from there, we immediately conclude that the amplitude should be quadratic in logs because this is a Gaussian. So by whatever I will get will be, uh, will be quadratic. And the anomalous dimension that we're after will be just expressed in terms of the inverse of this, uh, of this shifted kernel. And the shifted kernel uh, and there's being some very simple deformation of the BS kernel. So the BS kernel here is this matrix, which I wrote here in a block, uh, in block form by splitting, you know, Bessel function with even an odd uh, parity. <clears throat> And uh, so the, the, BS, the BS kernel, the indeformed case is when alpha is pi over four. This is just the way we introduce our angle. Um, <clears throat> and all the other cases we can get by just changing alpha. So that's what we found. So we have three, three quantity in the end and, and all of them we can get from a single object, this uh, deformed BS kernel by using the very same formula, but with different angles. So the octagon is alpha equal to zero, the cusp is alpha equal pi over four, and the hexagon is alpha equal pi over three. So these quantities that control the off diagonal behavior of at the origin. And we can also get the constant. So the constant is naturally uh, related to uh, the determinant of whatever quadratic form is controlling the Gaussian integral. And uh, that, one, that one pick a contribution from every angle. So that is a formula. And that's a very convenient way of uh, encoding the answer at weak coupling, for instance, the matrix truncate very quickly because uh, the matrix element of this kernel are extremely small in the coupling. And so we can just invert by power expanding it and generate these uh, this numbers here. So what we see is the structure is the same as for the cusp, 
sin zeta as far as the cusp. The only difference is that the coefficients are now dressed by some powers of cos alpha. Okay. And we found, of course, that there is agreement with this perturbation theory through seven loops. We could also play a little bit with numerics to see, for instance, where is the radius of convergence. It, it, it ends up not being the dependent on alpha. And we could also explore a little bit the nature of the singularity that will emerge, but I will skip that. <clears throat> the, the octagon is a special point where we already knew, uh, well, expect to, I mean, we had some expectation for what the answer should be. And here we can see that indeed all the odd zeta value are um, dropping out here simply because uh, when we set alpha to zero, we are killing the off diagonal term in this, uh, in this matrix. And the off diagonal term are the one that are essentially uh, containing the odd zeta, the rest are just about pi and powers of pi. And, uh, and in fact, it, it is indeed equivalent representation for this octagon as was found by uh, these people. And there is also a formula we can get for the determinant. Okay, I will probably try to conclude with some numerics here. So um, at finite coupling, what we can do is to plot uh, by truncating. So we have this infinite dimensional matrix that we can truncate at any finite value of the coupling and invert numerically. And then we get this very nice plot, which are showing the, the, showing the dependence of the anomalous dimension on the coupling for the three value of interest here, which are zero, the cusp and the hexagon. And we can compare with strong coupling. So we can also get prediction of strong coupling by solving numerically, uh, sorry, analytically, that is the recipe. And, uh, and we can verify that indeed this, um, this curve are going to, to what we expect to get. And we do get some funny number like this square root of three, for instance, which was a bit uh, suspicious at the beginning, but end up also being, uh, being there in the string theory. Um, in principle, it's also, it's also possible to do some systematic analysis of strong coupling. So there are loops at strong coupling. These are worksheet loops. It's a much more complicated analysis. And there are some new transcendental numbers uh, showing up, like uh, involving derivative of psi evaluated at whatever angle we, we inject. And uh, the situation is very different also as far as the nature of the series is concerned because the series is divergent, non borel summer So, I mean, it's strong coupling is terrible in this respect. <clears throat> anyway, we can do the determinant as well and uh, we can play with this minimal surfaces analysis to uh, validate our uh, result. Um, it's a nice story, but I won't have time, but it does work. And in particular, this square root of three is also um, predicted by the TBA equation, which are controlling the, the area of the minimal surfaces at strong coupling. Okay, I guess I should conclude probably. So um, uh, six grown amplitude are very nice and simplify a lot at, at the origin of kinematical space, in particular the exponentiate. And there are a lot of nice and intriguing relations that I try to, to explain and convey, but in fact, we understand nothing. That's probably the, the problem. So we don't understand why it exponentiate. We don't understand why this relation are true, like the fact that there is a <coughs> coincidence in the, in the value of some of the coefficient, uh, I mean, some anomalous dimension <coughs> that we are finding with the one found for correlators. Um, we don't know if it has anything to do with some sort of factorization. At least it's not clear that the correlator we are interested in, <coughs> the Wilson loop we are interested in has no R charge, while the correlator has a lot of R charge. So it's not clear how that could work out among them. And, uh, and also we found like some way of encoding all of this information in some sort of tilted BS kernel. So just to, so the BS kernel is what controls the cusp again. And we are just like, modifying slightly such as to accommodate for other quantities that were not known before, at least were not studied before, and which end up to, 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 to be there in the description of scattering amplitude. <clears throat> but here again, we don't know what this angle means. It's just something that we put by hand and it's not clear how many of this angle or different value of this angle can be relevant for scattering amplitude, nor if this angle has any geometrical meaning. So what is the, what is the geometry behind that? We, we don't know. And uh, finally, there is this comment, I mean, this question about higher multiplicity, to which extent 
all of that is based on some, you know, very uh, simple or exceptional property of the six gluon um, amplitude. While we started to uh, gather evidence that this is not just a story about the six gluons, there is also a story about uh, higher polygons. And uh, in particular, the, the, the first thing to check is whether we do get double logs. And, and this we know now that it is the case for four loops for, for the heptagon. And we do also have <coughs> the belief that it is going to work uh, for the higher end gun. But we don't really know yet how general this is and, and also why this is, uh, this is so. So I believe there are still many, many interesting questions that needs to be uh, answered. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, let's thank Benjamin. Do you have any questions, David? Please. Um, okay. So, uh, Benjamin, my question is about the absence of non-trivial multiple zeta values. Okay. I mean, that was quite apparent that you don't see zeta phi 3 and zeta 7 3, but I believe that that continues non trivially at weight 12. Can you associate that with um, uh, uh, being constrained to um, a single valued uh, multiple zeta values? Because my understanding is those don't occur in even weight, or is there some other reason? Well, <clears throat> at, uh, currently, I cannot, I, I cannot associate it to anything. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, what I can say is that, for instance, I could already ask myself this question for the cusp anomalous dimensions. The cusp anomalous dimension, we believe we know mm -hmm. through integrability. Uh, there is this BS equation again. I was perhaps a bit too fast on that, but we do have a, a way of calculating the cusp anomalous dimension order by order in perturbation theory. And this is all about inverting this matrix of uh, overlap of Bessel function that cannot do anything else than producing these simple zetas. It's just not possible. So if you buy this uh, integrability on that, then just impossible to get anything else. And what we are seeing is that these other anomalous dimensions are made out, I mean, they are made of the same wood, they are not that different. <clears throat> we are using the same information again and again, mm. just recycling. And because of that, we cannot get them. But I, I will not say I have a good reason. I mean, I don't know any good reason why this has to be, uh, why I should not be able, perhaps Lance and friends have some explanation, but I don't have any reason. You see, the, um, the thing that fascinated me was the Kanishi anomalous dimension where I think every four loops, some new uh, uh, structure comes in that you start to see multiple zeta values. Uh, uh, zeta values well, of loops and, and multiple zeta values eight loops. You, you don't see anything in your iterative procedure that could produce. No. So in the case of Konishi, the way we understand it from integrability, so there is in the case of integrability, there is a description that we call asymptotic, and then there are correction to this asymptotic description that take into account what we call finite size correction. Mm -hmm. And these finite size corrections they are way more complicated than the asymptotic one, and they do have the potential for creating. Uh, these more complicated uh, zeta values, multiple zeta values. So the asymptotic ones, they just can't. If the answer is correct again, there are a lot of conjecture there. Just impossible, it's not built in. But um, the wrapping, there are complicated integrals and mm -hmm. out of these complicated integrals, you can get a lot of stuff, including these uh, multiple zeta values. Uh, here also in principle, although it's, <clears throat> it's a very asymptotic construction, we don't have anything like wrapping correction here in this construction. Um, while in the end we get complicated integrals and we could imagine getting something uh, more complicated. But in fact, in the way we read out the information from this <clears throat> OP integral by, by taking this residue at small a and so on, it's just completely impossible to, to get complicated structure because it's just washing out everything complicated. So. But it's not, okay, it's not an explanation. At least we can give an argument based on the OP that presumably it's impossible to get anything else. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Bye. Yara, Yara, you had a question? Yeah, just a quick question. So you said uh, you are also looking at higher points, but what about NMHV six point? Did you try yeah, to look at? Well, that's a good, okay. That's a good question. It looks like things will not work as nicely for the uh, NMHV. So in particular, it's not uh, it's not uh, exponentiating. 
but even in front of a single R invariant, if you don't look at a full amplitude, but you just break it into pieces. Just one component, uh, you mean? Yeah. One yeah, yeah, no, I, I, what I remember also, I think it, Lance looked at it, and, uh, but what I remember from what he found is that uh, it was not, uh, I mean, there could be some nice structure, but it's definitely not just some exponential. So that is something special about MHB, uh, which, which again, it's not, not clear why, but. Um, yeah, okay, I you. might interrupt for a second. Is it <clears throat> Exponentials have a one over L factorial in front of the log to the L, 2L. This one has a one over L factorial squared, which looks more like a Bessel function than a exponential. But we don't understand any more than that. Thank you. Okay, and we have a very quick question from Nima. Yeah, this is a kind of an, uh, an off the wall question. I think I, I, I'd asked the, uh, or talked about this with Lance last fall, but I don't uh, remember the answer. Um, you have the, uh, the uh, Kij matrix, right? And the Kij is a function of alpha and the Kij goes like G to the I plus J. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to, uh, uh, at least it's uh, sensible by powers of G to talk about the minors of that matrix. They all have the same, they all, they're all of the same weight. Do, have you, do you happen to know, are the minors of this matrix positive? Um, I don't know. I, I've never checked, never tried to look at this uh, as a minor, so. I don't know either. We were talking about a different matrix, Nima. Oh, okay, sorry. I guess I should have looked for this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th th this has the most, the most obvious Henkel-like structure where it goes, uh, yeah. where Kij goes like something to the I plus J. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's well, something nice often happens when you have that structure with total positivity. I was just curious. Yeah, we should look. <clears throat> okay, let's thank Benjamin once again. 